Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second of three S, uh, IPS Northern Lectures by Dr. Nolene Hazer, our 10th SR Northern Fellow for the Study of Singapore. Today, Nolene will be delivering her second lecture titled, Great Disruptions, the Struggle for Our Normative Future. Following her lecture, Nolene will take questions from the audience in a Q&A session. The Q&A session will be chaired by Professor Tommy Koh, Ambassador at Large by the, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and IPSS Special Advisor. Before we begin, please allow me to go over some housekeeping rules at the, for the event. The lecture is being streamed live on Facebook. It will also be recorded and uploaded onto our IPS website and our social media platforms later. Please submit your comments and questions at any time during the lecture through the Facebook comments. For our audience members at the location here, please step up to the mic during the Q&A session to ask your questions. We will try our best to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A. For our live audience members, please also switch your mobile phones to silent mode to avoid any interruptions. We would also like to hear your views on the event. There will be a QR code and a link on the Facebook comment box at the end of the lecture, which you can click on to submit your feedback. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Noli Hazer to begin her second lecture, Great Disruptions, the Struggle for Our Normative Future. Dr. Hazer, please. It's a real honor for me to deliver my second lecture this afternoon. And it is a great privilege to have Professor Tommy Koh to moderate this session. Everyone I know in the United Nations holds Prof Koh in the highest esteem. So thank you, Prof Koh. Many thanks also to friends and colleagues present in this hybrid event and everyone participating virtually. My lecture today is called Great Disruptions, the Struggle for a Normative Future. Our world has entered a new era of uncertainty, anxiety, and complexity, overlaid by four great disruptions that have burst open historical fault lines, creating great fractures in their wake. The COVID-19 global pandemic, revealing deep socioeconomic divides. The second and is the climate crisis, deepening intergenerational divides. The cyber world with its digital divide and conflict with its peace and security divide. The handling of these disruptions combined with our shared vulnerability, will be one of the greatest tests of our generation. The challenges we face in our interconnected but divided world are unprecedented. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, warns, and I quote him, we are at an inflection point in history. In our biggest shared test, since the Second World War, humanity faces a stark and urgent choice, a breakdown or a breakthrough. The Secretary General's warning is a wake-up call. The disruption affects every person in every country. And you may want to very quickly look at the slides to look at what a breakdown looks like. You will be living in an area of deep pandemics, deadly pandemics, the planet will not be able to support life and there will be destabilizing inequalities. But if we have a breakthrough, we will have sustainable recovery, healthy people and planet, trust and social protection. Now, these solutions that we seek will not be found country by country. The crises we face are global, and resolving them depends on the effectiveness of multilateral governance. The scenario of breakdown with perpetual crisis is a clear possibility, 
But so too is the scenario of breakthrough with the prospect of an inclusive, sustainable and resilient future. The two possibilities, as you have seen, has been illustrated by our diagram. Now, just as the founders of the United Nations came together, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, the purpose of multilateral governance in the 21st century is to come together to save succeeding generations from major existential risks to our future. Now, while the fundamental purpose and principles of the United Nations endures, the world has changed, creating new needs that call for new normative frameworks and arrangements to address interlocking disruptions that are endangering the very safety and sustainability of human life. The pandemics, the climate emergency, the dark side of the cyber world, and armed conflict. Now, in this lecture, I will discuss the four great disruptions in greater detail and the struggle for new norms and practices in multilateral governance as we rethink sustainable development for equality, inclusion, sustainability, and resilience in the post-COVID-19 world. Now, in the process, I will also consider how Singapore fares amidst these struggles, and if Singapore of today can be a key thought leader for change in the multilateral world. So let me share with you what I see as the four great disruptions. Now, disruptions brings about radical change that transforms our lives and our world. They can either be a doorway to a new possibilities or a force of destruction. It is up to us how we meet the challenges of these disruptions. And unfortunately, we do not have the luxury of time. The choices we make now individually and collectively, will determine the fate of generations to come. A great disruptor that links today with tomorrow and this generation with the next is climate change. It is one of the defining challenges of our time and its adverse impacts undermine the ability of countries to sustain their development and provide human security. Climate change is already transforming ecological systems, changing weather patterns, impacting agricultural production, food security, and water security. From heat waves and floodings in Europe, to dust storms and air pollution in the major cities of Asia, to droughts in Africa, to conflicts over access to clean water and land use, to melting glaciers and rising sea levels, the effects of climate change are being felt all over the world, affecting the health, well-being of people and the planet. Another very significant disruption of our time is the digital revolution. The rise of smart machines, AI and robotics will have dramatic impacts for jobs and the way we work and live. These new technologies hold great potential and will open up a whole new world for us, our children, and generations to come. At the same time, however, these very technologies can also increase risks and accelerate inequality. Entire sectors of labour markets are disappearing. And although new opportunities are emerging, the jobs created are not the same. Our children may have to have more than one job and more than one career, engage in lifelong learning, and keep gaining new skills over the course of their lifetime. Despite enormous benefits, new technologies are also being abused to commit crimes, incite 
hate, spread falsehood, exploit and invade privacy. The pandemic has also demonstrated that digital solutions must be supported by strong cybersecurity frameworks. Given cyber attacks on hospitals, medical research facilities, and other essential infrastructure. Now, amidst increasing vulnerability and challenges of sustainability, we also see new trends of political upheavals. While protracted conflicts that have lasted for decades remain without solutions in sight. Today, over 84 million people, or one in every 95 person, endure forced displacement due to persecution, conflict, ethnic cleansing, and mass atrocities, combined with the inability of the international community to work together to effectively stop wars, protect civilians, and build and preserve peace. This massive forced displacement crisis has affected the national politics of developed countries. Amidst heightened vulnerability and feelings of insecurity, we have witnessed a rise in the securitization of national borders with severe impacts on migrants and refugees who are increasingly perceived as threats to national security. We are faced with new threats from the rise of violent extremism, from ethno-nationalism, the spread of hate speech, helping to fuel xenophobia, from the weakenings of norms and institutions that promote tolerance and justice, protectionism, divisive politics, racism, and narrow self-interest threaten to weaken the multilateral order and collective global interests. The COVID-19 pandemic is a disruption like no other. Its economic, social and health impacts are unprecedented since World War II and have magnified inequality, insecurity and humanitarian challenges worldwide. The impacts are playing out along the fault lines of inequalities, of wealth, decent jobs, access to resources, social protection, the ability to influence decision-making. The most vulnerable people are the bottom 40%. The World Bank reports that poverty has increased as a result of COVID-19, with 97 million more people in poverty as a result of the pandemic. The worst affected are the daily wage workers, our casual workers, the informal sector workers and caregivers. For most of them, working from home means being out of a job. Livelihood losses have led to food insecurity, hunger, evictions, and homelessness for people who have no savings and social protection. Our bottom billion have no access to, to social protection and affordable health care. Just think of that. Migrants have lost employment and remittances have declined by U.S. 100 billion, leading to further misery. This crisis, the pandemic crisis, has taken a disproportionate toll on women and girls. Women make up the majority of caregivers and healthcare workers. We know that many women and girls face greater risks of violence as we impose at-home isolation. We know that many women are becoming the brunt of the pandemic's social and economic impacts as they are concentrated in the hardest hit sectors, the most vulnerable jobs and in informal employment with the least social protection. Girls have dropped out of schools and child marriage has increased. In fact, 
the UN estimated that 23.8 million additional children may drop out or not have access to school due to the pandemic alone. The pandemic has not stopped conflicts or displacement with disastrous consequences for refugees, displaced people, and undocumented migrants, making it dangerous or even impossible for many to live with mass rates, arrests, and detentions. The illicit economy of human trafficking and smuggling are on the rise as people prefer to die trying. Addressing the, this inequality and social exclusion challenge is at the very core of sustainable recovery. By failing to protect the health and safety of our most vulnerable, we put our entire society at risk. In our age of great disruption, we need to pause. Pause and ask ourselves, are we heading towards a, a utopia of dreams and ideals or a waking nightmare of a dystopia? If our material and technological progress is not rooted in the foundation of ethics and compassion, we will end up as slaves to our most advanced inventions. In this short story, The Machine Stops, E.M. Foster presented a dystopian vision of civilization in crisis. I quote him, but humanity in its desire for comfort had overreached itself. It had exploited the richness of nature too far. Quietly and complacently, it was sinking into decadence and progress had come to mean the progress of the machine. How do we ensure that progress and development empowers humanity and safeguards our natural world? What are the principles of global governance that can contribute to a sustainable and resilient future? So let me share what this rethinking of sustainable recovery could look like. What COVID-19 has shown is that eventually the weakest link will give way and infect other parts of society and that the whole will suffer. We can't quarantine the problems of the forgotten and the vulnerable in our societies, full stop. Sooner or later, they become everyone's problem. Only an inclusive global public health and socioeconomic response will help suppress the virus, restart our economies, and recover sustainably. This requires a three-pronged approach. First, a large-scale, coordinated, and comprehensive health response. Universal access to health must be a critical global public good, as controlling the pandemic is the main prerequisite for global recovery. We need COVID-19 vaccines that are affordable and universally accessible for everyone, everywhere. And second, we need to protect current core capacities to safeguard lives and livelihoods and address the devastating social and economic dimensions of the crisis with a focus on expanding economic and social protection to the most vulnerable, keeping households afloat, businesses sovereign, supply chains functioning, and our institutions and services, delivering the services and social protection that we need. Thirdly, a recovery process that builds back better leading to more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable economies and societies, as well as an international system that can protect our global commons and deliver 
on global public goods. Now, recovery is an opportunity to address the great disruptions, the climate crisis, the inequality gaps in our social protection system, the shift from the quantity of growth to the quality of life, global health security, placing the well-being of every person at the core. Four priorities with new normative frameworks and actions on existing arrangements are needed to deliver and protect global public goods as we build back better. So what are they? First, tackling inequality to revive economies and livelihoods. As COVID-19 unfolds as a global pandemic of unprecedented re reach, one thing is clear, COVID-19 has exacerbated inequalities. But not only are low-income and marginalized populations more exposed to risk, but the pandemic is likely to entrench inequalities within and between countries. To recover from COVID-19 and prepare for future global pandemics, there are many steps that we need to take in, a, in our fragmented world. And we need to ask some very hard questions. Are the institutions of the 21st century capitalism equipped to protect the vulnerable, protect global public interests, and prioritize global health security over commercial profits? What are the norms and values public policies, civil society action, and discourses we need locally, nationally, and globally to combat inequalities that have made us so vulnerable in the first place? How can we promote a more inclusive and sustainable pandemic recovery? Two, we need to think about bridging the digital divide. We need to ensure that people are not left behind in an increasingly digital world where jobs and services are increasingly based on digital literacy and access. Affordable internet access and literacy are public goods that require investment to accelerate inclusive digital transformation, to promote e-commerce for small businesses, e-governments and e-services, digital connectivity, and ICT in education. However, technological advances are moving faster than our ability to respond or even to comprehend them. We are not prepared for the profound impact of the digital world on the labour market and the very structure of society. Besides skills training to enter the, this world, People need to understand the dark side of the cyber world and develop new norms for cyber security. The third area to build back better is greening the economy. We must embed long-term sustainability as a core element in our global COVID-19 recovery striving to achieve the goal of net zero carbon emission by 2050 is imperative to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and keep the worst impact of climate change at bay and protect the ecosystem of our planet. We already have multilateral frameworks to strengthen international cooperation, to ensure a sustainable future for all our people and for our planet the Paris Climate Agreement, the Agenda 2030 on Sustainable Development, make up a plan of action, the roadmap for people, planet, and prosperity. Their urgent implementation will be a decisive turning point in the global quest for a safer, more sustainable, and prosperous future. Finally, to build back better, we need to uphold human rights and good governance. These are central to a rule-based multilateral governance, one that is able to deliver
peace and security, and address drivers of conflicts. There has been an overall breakdown in trust in major institutions worldwide. worldwide. Due to failures to deliver public goods that people need most, to be fair and inclusive, to tackle corruption, to provide reliable information, and to make a difference in people's life. Building back better from the pandemics then needs to include respecting fundamental human rights and addressing long-standing concerns in relation to democratic space, justice, and the rule of law. People are struggling, struggling to be heard and to participate in decisions that affect them. Political leaders, institutions, and influential actors need to identify gaps in state people and business community governance relations to promote greater inclusion, participation, trust, and solidarity. Let me just pause a little while for you to, take, to understand that framework of disruption and also what we can do to address them. But I want to bring you now to the struggle for a normative future. COVID-19 has not only deepened vulnerability everywhere, but also brought new urgency to the choices before us. Even before the pandemic, we were witnessing a wave of protests, especially among youth across the world. Now, while each institution, uh, situation is unique, they share common features. There was already a growing deficit of trust between people, especially the young, and political institutions and leaders. COVID-19 threw these concerns into even sharper focus. The young saw their future compromise as they compared their realities to the lives of the powerful, many of whom increased their wealth during the pandemic. Severe austerity measures to deal with the global financial and debt crisis, and now the pandemic, created deep social wounds, wounds of joblessness, lost opportunities, a sense of deprivation and insecurity, especially among young, marginalized communities, and the loss of trust in established elites and institutions, and the desire to overthrow them. People need agency and voice in crises. And more than ever, governments need to be open, responsive, and accountable to the people they are seeking to protect. People want a greater say in decisions about their lives, greater opportunities, and shared prosperity. That's not too much to ask. They are calling for social and economic systems that work for everybody. They want gender and racial equality, their human dignity and human rights respected. Otherwise, the pandemic provides the perfect breeding ground for conspiracy theories and space for ideologues and, and extremists to generalize divisions, to energize divisions and political support by demonizing the other, to manipulate narratives and advance their own normative frameworks and agendas, undermining the ability of multilateral governance to deal with global challenges and the interlocking disruptions that I spoke about. Multilateral governance has already become more difficult against the backdrop of a heightened sense of insecurity and unfairness, leading to a rise in populism nationalist agendas and conspiracy theories, including in powerful states like the United States of America, the guarantor of the global rule-based order. As long as there is a disconnect between local people and the institutions that serve them, if people are no longer confident 
that the global rule-based system is working for them, there will be a deep crisis of trust, a loss of shared understanding, and the belief in the integrity of scientific information that guides global decision-making. The UN Secretary General has warned that this infodemic, as he calls it, affecting our world and the war on science must end by def defending a common, empirically-backed consensus around facts, science, and knowledge on how we share our society and this fragile planet. Unfortunately, trust in multilateral governance has also been weakened by a global economic system that despite significant country variations, displays some critical features everywhere. It devalues women's work and the provision of care and destroys the national environment. It has led to an extreme concentration of wealth and power among the few, whilst causing a deep sense of insecurity and desperation among the many, including the hollowing out of the middle class and income stagnation among workers in powerful economies. This, in turn, has further fueled a range of unsettling political dynamics, including widespread disenchantment with mainstream politics, hostility towards elites and rising ethno-nationalism, often fueled by the ideas of a return, a return to an imagined greater past founded on a different normative framework, including on women's roles and gender equality. But going back is not the answer. Instead, we need to raise the bar for economic, social, environmental, and gender justice to prevent a health crisis from turning into a human tragedy. There is an urgent need to rebuild trust and to value what matters to people and to the planet. We need to put the inclusion, protection, and participation of the excluded at the heart of a renewed global social contract, like the consensus that was forged at the birth of the United Nations. And this requires a transformative framework of norms and practices best suited to the economic and social needs of the 21st century that invests in the nexus of sustainable development, human security, and peace. It requires widespread consultative engagement and action on what it means to place inclusion, sustainability, gender equality, and social justice at the center of our COVID-19 response and that of the interlocking disruption of our time. This is the normative struggle for our future as we respond to the pandemic and heal our divided world. If we fail, Dr. Henry Kinsinger in his work, in his book, World Order One, we might, and I quote him, face a period in which forces beyond the restraints of any order determine the future. Now, let's think of how do we seize the opportunity for change. As no single nation or government, however powerful, can on its own address the great disruptions of our time, there is increasing and rising interest to reinvigorate our capacity for international cooperation and collective action. The hard work of international cooperation must continue. Moving past rising nationalism in domestic politics, weak governance practices at the national and corporate level, geopolitical rivalry and unilateral action of big powers that have weakened 
multilateral governance. I'm going to take you on the next journey, but let me just let you pause for a minute to just recapture what I have said in terms of the great disruption and the type of struggles that are before us and the forces that we have unleashed and what we need to do to calm them down. If you look at this diagram, we want a much stronger multilateral governance. And that means looking at norms and practices that will work for the 21st century. We need a new era of multilateralism as countries and other actors work to solve the problems that matter most, an international system that acts fast for everybody in an emergency, all actors accountable for keeping commitments made, and the United Nations as a trusted platform for collaboration for growing numbers and diversity of actors. Now, I'm going to use three examples to bring you on the next stage of this journey. And these are the three examples that have seized opportunities to rebuild trust in the system for the well-being of people and planet. So one would be on specific coalitions of member states that have emerged and form constructive engagement to develop constructive multilateral solutions to transnational problems. I will use the example of the Coalition for People's Vaccine or vac Vaccine Multilateralism. I will demonstrate, using the example of the Global Governance Group or the 3G, how medium and small countries can serve as effective champions of the international rule-based order. The second example, because that one was on member states. Now, the second example would be on multi-stakeholders alliances that have emerged to develop practical responses to pressing problems like climate change. Generally, the multilateral discussions is very state-focused, but orienting it around urgent problems, seeking solutions at a time of geopolitical divisions requires opening the circle. And this is most evident in actions around climate change, where cities, subnational government, uh, governments, the private sector and youth are often the lead. Gaining a better understanding of where and when non-state actors can make positive contribution is an, an important task ahead. Now, the third focus. So the first one, I talked about states. The second one, multilateral governance in terms of uh, multi-stakeholder multi alliances. But the fourth, I the, fifth, the third one, I'll be focusing on community organizing. The focus on women as game changers in global governance, using the principles of the international rule-based order to set new norms and legal frameworks of human security, human rights, and human development is absolutely important. The story of multilateral governance is not just about its legal history, but importantly, its social history. Power functions not just through hierarchy and authority, or purely through laws and institutions, but also through networks and social movements. New forms of global cooperation rooted in community organizing and strengthened by transnational solidarity. In the process, they shape a different form of multilateralism, going beyond interstate cooperation and towards prioritizing human well-being from the ground up. So let me start with the first example, vaccine multilateralism, and I'll be also talking about Singapore. Now, right from the inception, the pandemic has been marked 
by a lack of international cooperation. The pandemic has been addressed through uncoordinated and generally isolated national responses. It has revealed the weakness of multilateral governance as rich countries follow nationalistic agendas and multilateral institutions and norms have been found wanting. However, the pandemic has also made it very clear that multilateralism, not nationalism, is the answer for recovery and to build back better. The pandemic offers a window of opportunity to help advance multilateral innovation, such as giving a stronger voice and a mechanism to small and medium countries to engage in global health governance. Now, from the very start of the pandemic, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has championed a people's vaccine and vaccine equity. In fact, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros has warned the world against vaccine appetite and today is asking for a pandemic treaty because of the discovery of a new virus, Omicron. The multilateral COVID facility was established in April 2020 by WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and CEPI. To organize the collective procurement of vaccines on behalf of more than 100 countries. Singapore was an early supporter of the COVAX facility and was among the first country to join. It is the only global initiative that is working with governments and manufacturers to ensure COVID-19 vaccines are available worldwide to both higher income and lower income countries. Singapore recognizes the importance of a coordinated multilateral response to overcome the impact of the pandemic. The term vaccine multilateralism was in fact coined by Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung at the June 2020 Global Vaccine Summit to build back frameworks of international cooperation to adequately meet the COVID-19 challenge. To quote him, discovering, producing and distributing a safe and effective vaccine is vital to get life back to normal despite COVID-19. I hope that this summit will help focus our minds and resources and forge partnerships to promote vaccine multilateralism. Singapore committed US $5 million contribution to support 92 lower and lower middle income countries access to the COVID facility. Now in July 2021, at the APAC informal leaders retreat, Prime Minister Lee also stressed, and I quote him, countries whose vaccination programs are ahead should make their excess vaccination supplies available to others. Thus, Singapore intends to donate our vaccines under the COVAX initiative to other countries. Now, as chair of the Forum of Small States or FOSS, Singapore has also been invited to be a member of the access to the COVID-19 tools that what is called ACC, ACC Accelerators and they have a facilitation council. And this allows Singapore to ensure that the perspective of small states are considered in discussions about access. Now, with significant advances in research and development by scientists, academia, the private sector, and government, the ACT Accelerator has secured a way to end the acute phase of the pandemic by deploying the tests, the treatment, and the vaccines the world needs. Now, in February 2021, the UN Secretary General addressed the Security Council to propose the creation of an emergency task force by the Group of 20. 
of the G20 countries to prepare and help implement a global immunization plan. And I quote him, the rollout of COVID-19 vaccine is generating hope. At this critical moment, vaccine equity is the biggest moral test before the global community. He noted that progress on vaccination has been very unfair globally, with just 10 countries having administered 95% of all vaccines, when 130 countries have not yet received a single dose. He stressed that the G20 is well placed to prepare such a plan and coordinate its implementation, bringing together all with the required power, scientific expertise and financial capabilities, as well as the WHO and financial institutions. The importance of vaccine multilateralism and COVAX has also been stressed and agreed by the 3G, a group of 30 countries initiated by Singapore to channel the views of small and medium countries more effectively to the G20 during their meetings. Now, last year, Prime Minister, last month, Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung was invited to the G20 summit in Rome with its agenda, People, Planet, Prosperity, which focused on a sustainable and inclusive recovery from COVID-19 and a commitment to protect our climate. He reinforced the UN Secretary General's call to build collective resilience through faster manufacturing and deployment of vaccines worldwide and supported the G20's proposal reforms to improve global health governance and financing amidst the pandemic. He shared how Singapore has used its logistic capacity, airport and ultra cold chain facilities to become a distribution hub for vaccine. This is a good example of how 3G, a coalition of 30 member states, has emerged to forge constructive engagement to push for change. And Singapore, as a leading member of the 3G, has been able to champion the voice of small countries calling for vaccine equality to close gaps in global health security. That is one example of how states can create new spaces to influence multilateral governance. Let me now turn to my second example, which is about the multi-stakeholder alliances for climate action. Even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis remains the existential challenge of our time. Its adverse impacts will stall development, affect food security, fuel intense storms, rising seas and displacement, transform ecosystems and threaten public health and human security. Now, all leaders at the recent COP26 have warned that we are already at the tipping point. The pace and scale of what we need to do over the next three decades to reach the goal of net zero carbon emission by 2050, to stabilize the global temperature rise at 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, and to prevent climate disaster is huge. Now, according to our best scientists, climate change with its consequences is a tragedy, a tragedy in the making, but it is still not too late if we take immediate action. And in the words of the world-renowned scientist, Stephen Hawkins, I quote him, climate change is one of the great dangers we face and is one we can prevent. Important reforms and concrete actions are needed to help with the economic and social transition to make substantial progress towards the goal of net zero carbon, greening our infrastructure, food production, 
housing and transport system, setting ambitious targets for fuel efficiency and clean energy transition, investing in green technology and jobs, innovative solutions and green businesses opportunities for all communities, leaving no one behind, respecting climate science and embracing evidence-based decision-making, shifting production and consumption patterns and respecting our forests and oceans. A huge agenda. So whilst governments remain essential in multilateral governance, the complex range of public policy and global cooperation challenges that we need to address the climate emergency can only be solved through effective multi-stakeholder alliances that bridge state and non-state actors, as well as the global and the local coalitions of like-minded actors coalescing around common goals are essential for urgent collective action towards sustainable development. And this approach involves gathering a wide variety of interested parties, governments, civil society, the private sector, philanthropy, international organizations, to lead specific initiatives. And to date, we have 73 countries um, uh, who are also parties to UNFCC, almost 400 cities, 768 businesses, and 16 investors, and they're all working to achieve net zero carbon emission by 2050. However, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC report, released in August of 2021, and prepared by 234 sci scientists from 66 countries, warns that time is running out, as global warming of two degrees Celsius will be exceeded during the 21st century. Unless rapid and deep reduction in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions occur in the coming decades, achieving the goals of the 2015 Paris Agreement will be beyond reach. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the IPCC report was nothing less than, and I quote him, quote read for humanity. He added that ahead of the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow in November, all nations, especially advanced G20 economies, need to join the net zero emission coalition and reinforce their promise on slowing down and reversing global heating with credible, concrete, and enhanced nationally determined contributions. In addition, he added, I'm asking corporate leaders to support a minimum international carbon price and align their portfolios with the Paris Agreement. The public and private sector must work together to ensure a just and rapid transformation to a net zero global economy. If we combine forces now, we can avert a climate catastrophe. Now addressing the G20 summit, Prime Minister Lee outlined three ways Singapore is preparing for the low carbon transition. Harnessing technology and investing in low carbon solutions, scaling up sustainable finance, including through the mobilization of private capital through innovative financing, and strengthening international collaboration on sustainability initiatives, including through cross-border power trade within our own region. Now, in February, Singapore also unveiled the Green Plan 2030, and I'm not going to address the whole thing, because you know it now by heart. Oh, and this is a whole-of-nation movement to advance Singapore's commitment 
under the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the Paris Agreement. Then in ASEAN, there's also now growing regional collaboration on sustainability initiatives to unlock the large and mutually beneficial economic opportunities in the push for decarbonization and sustainability. For example, Singapore is working to establish a regional power grid with ASEAN neighbours, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia and Singapore. And this would be a project that will facilitate cross-border power trade within the region. However, only a third of businesses in Singapore say they are strongly aligned to the Singapore Green Plan 2030, while less than a half are currently operating sustainability. And this is according to the Building a Greener Singapore study that was conducted by Schneider Electric this year, which surveyed over 500 businesses and consumers, respectively. Now, businesses report funding difficulties due to the financial and economic fallout of the pandemic and changing the culture of the company as the major barriers faced in turning green strategies into action. <clears throat> the key motivation for businesses to move towards a lower carbon economy were found to be government regulations, climate-related risks, and financial market pressure. However, consumers surveyed appeared to expect businesses to do more in this respect. Nine out of 10 Singaporeans support the country's transition away from fossil fuels to its energy uh, generation, but only around half were willing to pay higher prices for cleaner electricity as cost and convenience were topmost concerns when it came to greener living. <clears throat> World leaders and representatives at the COP26 summit have made promises to curb deforestation, phase down coal, and funding for fossil fuels abroad, and cut methane emissions. Some 450 financial organizations, who between them control $130 trillion, agreed to back clean technology and direct finance away from fossil fuel industries. And Singapore has joined the Powering Past Coal Alliance, a coalition of 137 countries and businesses promoting the transition from coal to clean energy and Minister for Sustainability and Environment, Grace Fu, recently promoted and co-facilitated Article 6 of COP26 on the global carbon market. Nonetheless, these are, there are still a significant gap between the measures countries have committed to and what is needed to avoid more than 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming beyond which the worst consequences of climate change will be felt. <clears throat> For the young, whose future is at stake, it is a race against time. Youth movements everywhere are demanding urgent climate action. And we are witnessing huge youth-led social movements unfolding community by community facilitated by social media and strengthened by transnational solidarity. In fact, during the COP26 summits, the youth were organizing global days of action for climate justice, and over 100,000 people marched in Glasgow to demand more action on the climate crisis. Alongside 100 climate change demonstration in 100 other countries around the world. Now, these young climate activists are using their moral authority as children and social media influence to rise in anger against a system they regard as aware of the climate emergency, but not acting in emergency to protect 
their future. And I will also, yeah, this last picture that you're seeing is also about Singapore. So it's not just about other countries, it is also about our young. Now, societal pressures and collaboration are vital <coughs> in the push for change. The call of the young is loud and clear, but let us not leave it to our children to cry out and pressure collective action to secure the future. Let me turn to my third and my last example, women as game changers in our innovative struggle. Women better than anyone understand the struggle for our normative future, establishing new norms and agendas to dismantle entrenched discrimination. From the birth of the UN Charter, which promises the equal rights of men and women, women participated actively in the multilateral space to address widespread gender inequality in legal, social, and economic rights. They pursued a strategy of inside-outside partnership to mobilize both the resources of the UN and civil society to change patriarchal norms and social arrangements and put difficult issues on the UN agenda to improve our human prospect. In particular, the four global UN conferences on women in Mexico, Copenhagen, Nairobi, and Beijing with the theme Equality, Development, and Peace, culminating in the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, catalyzed change for women in country after country. Let me share three examples of women as game changers when they were given leadership position in the UN. A dear friend of mine, Helvi Sapella, who has now passed away from Finland, was the first woman to hold the position of UN Assistant Secretary General in 1972. She used her position to organize the first ever conference on women in 1995 in Mexico that I've just referred to. This opened up new spaces for women everywhere to connect the aspiration of local people to global institutions and the international community. My another very close friend of mine, Dr. Nafis Sadiq, a doctor from Pakistan, was appointed in 1987 as the first woman from the developing world to head an operational fund of the UN as the executive director of the UN, uh, UNFPA. Now she brought a whole new narrative and perspective to population and development issues. Until then, believe it or not, the men were too afraid to talk sex when it came to population issues. Dr. Sadiq, supported by women civil society actors, forced to open the curtains and doors to reveal the scale of maternal mortality and the need to address sexual and reproductive health of women in population policies and programs. Now, me, myself, inspired by these women, I, as head of UNIFEM, supported by civil society, worked with the UN Security Council to establish Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, which criminalized the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war, and addressed the importance of women's perspectives and participation in decision-making for sustainable peace. Now, coming out of patriarchal societies, women wanted nothing less than the transformation of the 21st century to ensure that daughters had the same opportunities as sons, that women could realize their rights to quality education, employment, and health care, that women would not be undervalued, overworked, and underpaid, that there is a recognition and su social support for women's caregiving roles, that they have equal citizenship rights and would be free from violent conflicts, harassment, and sexual violence. From the beginning, women knew that they had to be 
the primary agents of change for this transformation. By using the values and platform of multilateral governance, women seize the opportunity for change and strive to achieve the transformation needed on a global scale to sustain the change. Women game changers unleash their power to foster what I call a people-centered multilateralism. And in the words of Ralph Bunch, when drafting the UN Charter, and I quote him, make change, even radical change, possible without violent upheaval. I'm pleased that Singapore in 2021 has embraced an inclusive society based on gender equality. From September 2020 to September 21, more than 100 dialogues with over 1,000 participants have reviewed issues affecting women as more Singaporeans realize the importance of engaging women, valuing women's experiences and expertise as a pathway to a more sustainable and caring future. Leaders globally are becoming more aware of the importance of removing gender barriers for both men and women to unleash the expertise and power of the female half of humanity to balance the male, to change the trajectory of, of vulnerability and co-create the well-being of people and planet. And finally, I just want us to just stop and think a little bit. In this age of great disruption, we are standing at the threshold of the future. Like the proverbial angel of history, our eyes are turned towards the past and present, even as we are propelled towards the future by the storm of progress. What does the angel of history see? A garden in an earthly paradise? or a wasteland of rubble at the edge of a dark abyss. What we choose to do now to our own species and our planet will not only profoundly shape our future, but remain as a testimony of our history. The UN has served as a platform for collective action, norm development, and international cooperation to solve the problems that matter most to our human existence. However, the UN alone can no longer address the numerous challenges confronting us in our complex and networked world. In my next lecture, I will discuss our common agenda and a renewed multilateralism to secure our future and how Singapore can contribute to this breakthrough that may lead us towards a garden and an earthly paradise, something to hope for. And I thank you. Thank you, Nolene. For those watching the lecture on Facebook, please submit your comments and questions through the Facebook comment box. For our audience members here, please step up to the mic to ask your questions. May I now invite Professor Tommy Cole to start the Q&A session. Professor, please. So I want to begin by thanking Nolene for having delivered a very important lecture. Yeah? And you have delivered it with great um, eloquence and uh, passion. The, oh, sorry. I can, can, I, can I take Yes, it? indeed, yeah. Um, the, the topic of your lecture um, has two parts. The first part is about the four great disruptions. And to, to summarize, the four great disruptions are the COVID-19 pandemic and future pandemics, the climate crisis, the dig digital revolution, and armed conflict. The second part of the topic is about building our, fut our nomadic future, normative future. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. 
Um, so my first question to you is, what are the norms? What are the norms which you think are important for us to uphold as we face the future? Yeah? Um, when I listened to you, I went through your lecture several times, I have identified uh, seven norms. Mm. So may I read them out? Yes, no. please. Yeah. So let me ask you whether these are the seven norms which you think are important yeah. for us to uphold as we face the future. Mm. Norm number one, equality. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm. Norm number two, inclusion. Mm -hmm. Norm number three, sustainability. Mm -hmm. Norm number four, resilience. Mm -hmm. Norm number four, human no, rights. Number five. Human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, five, right? Mm -hmm. Five. Human rights and gender equality. Mm -hmm. Six, good governance and trustworthy government. Mm -hmm. And finally, seven, international cooperation and multilateralism. Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Did I leave out anything? No, you. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Prof. Cole. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> um, you, you don't mind if I challenge you? Okay, uh, but I will have to challenge you back. Of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in the course of your wonderful lecture, you talk about the very unsatisfactory situation in the world concerning vaccines. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you said that 10 rich countries in the world possess 95% of the total vaccines that we have. And both Antonio Guterres and Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus have used very strong words mm -hmm. to describe the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Tedros call it vaccine apartheid, mm -hmm. you know. And the WHO has condemned countries like Singapore, which have given a booster shot to our population. The reason is that there are so many people in the world who have not received even the single first shot, you know. So. My question to you is, are Tedros and Antonio Guterres making unreasonable demand, mm. considering that we live in a world of nation states, you mm. know? We don't have world government, you know? We mm. live in a world of nation states. Mm. And naturally, every government will look after its, the welfare of its own people first. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister of Singapore will buy vaccines mm -hmm. for his own people first before he will donate them mm -hmm. to other countries, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is realism. Yes. So one has to balance realism and idealism. Mm -hmm. The idealistic situation would be if vaccines were freely available mm -hmm. to the 7 billion people of the mm -hmm. world. But that's not the kind of world we live in. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. So what is your own position? All right. Uh, Prof Ko, thank you. But first of all, I really want to thank you for moderating this session. You are just such a well of wisdom. So let me uh, take what you, uh, uh, at some of the ideas behind that, that question. I personally feel that it is important for countries to protect their population. Hmm? The, the issue is not just about access to vaccine. It is about the production of vaccine. It is how much, how, it is about intellectual property rights, basically. Right? Uh, and the fact that there are developing countries that have the capacity to produce more vaccine and be helped in the di kind of distribution. So instead of just looking at countries uh, that are using it, of course, we, we have to encourage uh, more production of, of vaccine and their distribution. But I, I honestly think... I'm sorry, could, can I interrupt you? Mm. But you, you realise that the government don't own the vaccine. I, this is exactly what the I'm coming to. The vaccines mm. were invented and manufactured by private commercial entities. Exactly. And, this, and they have intellectual property rights. Yeah, this you know? is exactly it. And, and exactly. I mean, they're not charities, you know. They, no. are, the, mm. they are pharmaceutical companies. Mm. Um, of course, we are very grateful to them that in such a short time, mm. they have come up with so many mm. effective vaccines. Yeah? Mm. So what are you proposing? Yeah, all right. So the, the thing is, that's why I asked the question, is our 21st century capitalism adequate? if we are going to make 
global public health a public good? The main reason is that I think in the long run, the companies will have to be aware it's not, you know, it's, it is a case of having short-term interests versus long-term interests. So how much, how can they actually, in a way, maybe not make so much profit? Just, you know, like, how much are they willing to invest in sustainability? Don't see it as a cost. Don't see it as uh, not making enough profits for their uh, shareholders. But really looking at the fact that they are having now uh, basically stakeholders who care about sustainability issues and who want to have a future. So I think at the end of the day, there, is, there needs to be a conversation. I mean, I don't think uh, we are going to have, uh, we can't just decide on something. I think we people have to, in a way, uh, develop the analysis, understand what are the trade-offs, and then to see that actually some of what we see as trade-offs are in fact not trade-offs, but that uh, they are part of a synergetic uh, framework of decision-making. That's my hope anyway, uh, Prof. Ko. Yes. I, I, I may be a bit too idealistic, but I honestly hope and pray that the corporate governance structure, and there are enlightened uh, people who will act out of self-interest and then see solidarity as self-interest. Yes, but, but you must also understand that if you're a pharmaceutical company and you've invested billions of dollars in research and development, that you would like to be able to recover the investment mm. and make some money for your shareholder. Yeah. I mean, this is legitimate, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, the only thing, Prof. Ko, is this, that they have also benefited from the investment of our countries, nation states, and also our uh, a more stable global order. Yeah? So, so it's not like it's just the technical knowledge of the production of these vaccines. It's the fact that we have helped to maintain a stable world order that help us to actually function as a human community. And I think that somehow we have not, the same way actually as not counting women's care work for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the idea that uh, there is not enough valuing. So it's basically is valuing our future slightly differently. So I hope, I mean, it's going to be a long run. Huh? It's not something so that will- we'll... I want to pin you down on this. Mm. So are you saying that Take two companies that we are familiar with, Pfizer and Moderna, mm. should waive the IPR, IPR? I think it really, basically, they need to actually, maybe even if they don't want to waive it, make like certain, there, I think the, the, the WTO has some arrangements whereby they allow countries to actually manufacture like some of the cheap drugs uh, with uh, the, the, the HIV AIDS drugs and all that. So there are like certain arrangements that can be arranged. So it's not like 100% uh, kind of wavering, but there are arrangements that can be made. And I think it requires a lot of the more, uh, what I would call uh, more imaginative thinking about how it's not an either or thing or a black and white thing. I, I would actually challenge people to come together to actually say, uh, how can we best uh, address this, this major issue? Are there ways of doing it? Um, President Biden has said he was willing to waive mm. the IP rights mm. you know, to the mm. vaccine, mm -hmm. but he doesn't own the IP rights. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Now, the European Union, on the other hand, said mm. it opposed mm. um, the, mm. the, the, the proposal to waive IP rights. Mm -hmm. And, and the European Union's argument is not without validity, mm. which is that it's not just IP rights, no? Mm. You need scientific know-how, infrastructure, yes, of course. time before mm. you can actually produce this vaccine. Mm -hmm. Even if, if somebody were to give you the formula, mm. it doesn't mean that you're able to produce Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so do, you, do you agree with Tedros in his condemnation of countries for giving their people booster shots? I, I don't uh, agree with him fully because I think we, if we need booster shots, we need booster shots. Uh, but, but at the same time, I think that we need... Wait, wait, sorry. If, if, your, if your vantage point is, is global equity, mm. then you should be against booster shots. 
No, the, the, the thing okay. is, I'm hoping that we will create greater. Uh, so in other words, don't look at it as a, a contained amount of vaccine. I honestly think we should be producing more and then having more networks of production centers and, and, and then and not, of course, go to countries where, where they don't have the capacity of production, but more uh, invest in countries that have the capacities or can be strengthened or capacities can be strengthened. So it's not to see it as a closed circle, but I would prefer to have more so that we don't have to go into this other argument. So that is my hope. I know it's not going to be easy, but I am a very hopeful person. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Dilip Nayan, did you want to ask the first question? <laughs> Hi. Thanks, Nolene, for a lovely lecture. I think it was, uh, I mean, your great disruptions are quite a bleak analysis, actually, of what the world is facing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I just wanted to say uh, one thing that uh, I don't know whether you have uh, uh, alluded to it or not. What the world today is lacking is global leadership. I mean, if we looked at what happened after the first war, after the wars, it was the leadership of the US that brought the world order to what it was, to what it has been for a long time. Mm. But now, you don't have a country which is, I mean, you have a country which is looking, looking inward, which is driven by all types of problems, and you don't have any other country which is coming up. China is still a bit uh, chary about taking this global leadership uh, position. So in that scenario, how do we hope that the world can emerge stronger? That's what I'm just alluding to. I'm just wondering what your opinions are on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you think... Do you think Biden is providing the world with the leadership it needs? You know, I think and we not need... who can do it. <laughs> Proko, I and and Del lovely to uh, to have you here. Now, the thing is, I tend to oh, well, once upon a time, we needed very powerful superpowers to shape the world and provide the type of guarantee and so on that we we need. I think now it is much more difficult, obviously, because power is very dispersed. And it's not just even within nation states. I mean, you have multilateral corporations who actually own greater wealth than some countries. Con some countries and in fact, wield greater power. And not only multilateral corporations, individuals. So the world has changed, become more dispersed, mm -hmm. and power has also been very dispersed and, and occur in different forms. Now, the thing is, we, of course, uh, are still very much a state-based uh, way of organizing multilateral governance. But I also feel uh, very much that one of the things that uh, came out of the common agenda uh, that the UN uh, uh, Secretary General actually put forth in the last uh, General Assembly was a network, inclusive multilateralism. Mm -hmm. And that, in a sense, allow us to say, all right, what type of, of uh, problems are we facing? What solutions, or who can bring forth what solutions to that specific problems? Who have the power? Mm -hmm to deal with, with those or that specific set of issues. So I don't think we need to wait until the emergence of another powerful state. I think that we, that's why I like the idea, and I've always uh, worked from it anyway. I like the idea of multilateralism from the ground up. And what it means is start with what are the problems uh, that you face because there's so many and they're so complex. I mean, we just talked about vaccine and see how complex it is. But so, so, and you can imagine that even if we are to look at um, climate change, there's so many different parts of it. Who can provide what solutions to what problems and who have the power and bring in, a, I, I, mean, I see it as an alliance of action uh, and then and start from the ground and then, who, and then bring in very powerful people, including states, to make that type of decision. In fact, um, 
uh, we th for a while thought that it was the G20 uh, uh, compared uh, to all just not just to the our G7, right? And and then and then we thought, okay, great, let's have the 3G, the Global Governance Group, to make sure that the the uh, G20 don't run away with their uh, agenda, but everybody comes in. But these are all innovation, and I think it is time to be very innovative. The, the reason why I think we have obviously um, the, prob the, the threat of the great disruptions, but I honestly think that we also have the human imagination okay. so can to I, do it. Can I uh, summarize your reply to Dilip by saying that we live in a new world, and maybe in this new world, you do not need the leadership of one powerful country, but a network of like-minded leaders from government, from cities, from private sector, civil society, and so on. You know? So, so let, let, me, let me read to you uh, two other questions that have come in, uh? mm. and then I think maybe we have to, to yeah. stop. Mm. Uh, Dr. Kanwaljit Soin has sent a question uh, read it to you. Mm. For international multilateral organizations, is it possible to weigh the interests of the most powerful members against the other less powerful members? And the next question is about trust. Because mm. in your lecture, you talk about trust mm -hmm. and the erosion of trust. Huh? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we rebuild trust mm. yeah. between okay. people in government, in authority, and so on? Mm. You know, uh, maybe let me start uh, with the second question of trust, huh? because it covers, uh, in, in, in a sense, why has trust been broken? Trust has been broken because people feel that there's a sense of unfairness, right? Trust has been broken because people expect certain things from leadership. Trust have been broken because when, they, when people go to work, they expect that the workplace will be safe and that they will be uh, allowed to work productively and so on and so forth. So if we are to rebuild trust, we need to understand what matter most to people. And not just the powerful and the elites. Different people have different interests and what matters to them. And most of the time, the people who are struggling, they want hum very basic things. Human security, lack of harassment, the capacity to dream a little bit for their children, the ladders of upward social mobility, the, the fact that the next generation can live better than the, the, this generation, that work goes somewhere. It's not that difficult. I mean, if you think of it just as what is it that mattered the most to people and what matters most to our planet as well. I mean, now it, we can't just leave the planet out of this uh, equation. It is our home. Mm -hmm. So if we, we look at what matters most, it is about protection. It is about participation. Because people want agency as well. I mean, they don't want even handouts. Huh? Uh, so basically, it's not like, OK, you know what? You need this. We give it to you, and you stay quiet. They want a sense that they are empowered. They want a sense of dignity. Mm -hmm. Give people dignity so that they can actually celebrate and flourish in the human context. So I think these are all things that will uh, build trust. And we need to have the right institutions, uh, the right leadership, mm -hmm. the accountable use of power, and power for whom, right? It's not power over. I think we have to break out of that concept of power over to be power with. How can we use power with to allow another to flourish as much as we flourish ourselves? And I think that this is like a new it's not so new, but the practice is going to be very new because uh, we are not there yet. So that's about trust, right? Uh, it is in terms of the, uh, what Dr. Soin yeah. has asked, uh, and this is uh, about the interests oh. of the powerful countries, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, versus the less powerful, powerful countries. 
And I think that for, I mean, the problem currently is that the powerful countries are involved with geopolitical rivalry of different sorts. The less powerful countries are trying to find a space of neutrality so that they're not caught again in the type of world that we experienced during the Cold War. That had a very high human toll, unfortunately. So, I think what will try to bring us together is actually to find where are the areas of common interest, where we can build solidarity, and have to like a, basically a framework of action. Where can we act together for our collective future, our common agenda? Where do we need to compete? Because I'm, I am an idealist, but I'm also a realist yeah. in the idealistic world, if you like. But where are the areas where we are competing? Where are the areas that we totally disagree because we have very different normative frameworks? Mm -hmm. When can we, how do we manage that? We also, unfortunately, we are living at a time that we don't manage that properly. We actually have in our power, the power of weapons of self-destruction, our nuclear power that can destroy the whole of human existence. And we need to be extremely careful how do we deal with that area of work. So I would say, please build where we can in the areas where we have common interests. Look at solidarity and self-interest, which is the part of my first lecture, where I stress the fact that what actually uh, helped to develop our multilateral world 76 years ago was a coming together of people of different interests, but who actually saw solidarity as self-interest and built the framework and also the pathway to move forward. And I think that we are at that stage, the angel of history. <laughs> Either we have to look into the past and the present and also into the future. I would, I would give a different answer to Kanwal Jit mm -hmm. I would say that um, we will always live in an unequal world mm -hmm. because there are big countries and small countries, rich countries and not so rich countries. And the world will always favor the big and the strong, you know. But those who are small and less powerful can organize themselves. Absolutely. So one of the good things that Singapore had done is that 29 years ago, we took the initiative to organize the small country. Mm -hmm. We created a forum of small states. Mm -hmm. And today, the forum of small states has 108 members, mm -hmm. which is a majority of UN membership. Absolutely. And by being together, it gives us collective strength. Mm -hmm. It amplifies our voice, mm -hmm. gives us leverage in negotiating with the big country, mm -hmm. and gives small country a better chance of getting elected Mm -hmm. to UN bodies, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the world is still unequal. It mm -hmm. will always be unequal. Mm -hmm. But I think force mm -hmm. has helped to make a little less mm -hmm. unequal. Right? Mm -hmm. I fully agree with you, Prof Ko. In fact, this is what the women uh, yeah. movement have been doing. Because individually, we are so weak. But then powerful. You look at what the type of changes we have been able to bring about. And this is because of transnational mobilization and organization. I think and we'll and ask that, you, I think, is important. i ask you a final question, then yeah. we have to go. Right? Mm -hmm. This is from Jim uh, Brumby from the World Bank Group. Mm -hmm. It's a very provocative question coming from the World Bank. <laughs> he said, some people have suggested that the World Bank should be repurposed for the sole task of climate change. Mm. Do you agree? I think the World Bank could, should be do, helping with the climate action, but don't forget the work on ending poverty. Development. And yeah, development is poverty. absolutely critical because I, I was so shocked at the figures that 97 million people are falling into poverty again. So I would say, please don't forget development. Yeah, so I, I guess our reply to Jim is that your work is not yet done. Your work is not yet done. But climate change will be part of your agenda. Absolutely right. Okay. So I think it's, it's 5.40. I promised my wife to end the session at 5.30, so I think <laughs> it's 
I better ask um, Nolene to share with us a concluding remark that they can take away from this inspiring session. Well, I don't really have a, a concluding remark, uh, Prof Ko, but I will leave it to you because <laughs> but you are the source of wisdom and my mentor, so I would allow you to say the concluding remark and I will go along with it. Okay. <laughs> wow. this, is, this is passing the buck. You know? <laughs> so let me, let me speak, speak on Nolin's behalf and say that, um, that the world faces four existential threats. And the current pandemic and future pandemic, climate crisis, the dark side of the digital revolution, and never-ending armed conflict. Um, we, we want to recover from these, prevent further crisis, but we want to do it in the right way. And we want to do it in a way that's based upon norms that we all support. Mm -hmm. And some of these norms have been articulated by Nolin, equality, inclusion, um, human rights, gender equality, good governance, trustworthy government, mm. and uh, putting the individual, the person, no matter how humble, at the core of everything that we do. Absolutely, absolutely. And with that, Prof Ko, I will have to add one more thing. And this, I promised my dear friend, Janet Lim, uh, because I talked about forced displacement. And this is, you know, she's very concerned about uh, the number of people who are displaced at this time. And her wish, and I think it, uh, it is so important for us to really reflect on this. And she said, you know, Singapore is now such a rich country. Um, what else can we do in terms of technical support, educational support, mm -hmm. financial support globally, but also in our neighborhood to support the displacement of people, the forced displacement of refugees and of undocumented migrants. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something because we tend to forget about the most disadvantaged. Right. And that is something I just want to share. Thank you, Prof. Cole, for this you know, wonderful session. Please join me in the congratulating Thank you, Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Ko and Dr. Hazer. We've come to the end of today's lecture. We would like to hear your views on the event. Please click our link on the Facebook feed to submit your feedback. Nolin's third and final lecture titled Securing Your Future, A Renewed Multilateralism will take place next Friday on 10 December. Details will be on our website and our Facebook page. We hope to see you then. Thank you all for attending today's lecture. We hope to see you then.